Hi everybody, in this episode we will turn our eyes to the extreme north in the lands of the edge of the frozen northern wastelands. A land where primordial giants roamed, where mammoths still live and where ancient relics are hidden under layers of ice and snow. Here is where we find the last of the giant kin, the small tribe of Obertroll, monsters of rock that are nested in the mountains of Dalrfjall. The troll start is very dire. They begin with tiny land and naval force limits. Their starting fleet is double the naval limit and with no nation to sell them to. The trolls are a monstrous race with a technology handicap, level 2 across the board and no feudalism. Their capital and most provinces are arctic mountains, making development very difficult. They are the largest humanoid race and live in caves. They are so large in fact that their starting provinces rise above the map's edge. Trolls also don't talk too much. They stand alone, cornered by the Bjarnerik rivers, with no allies to choose from and only two diplomatic slots available. Let's talk about their racial particularities, starting with their military. Of course, trolls are gigantic. The shock damage dealt and received is 33% higher than usual. This is particularly useful in the early game when shock damage rules the battlefields. Their thick skins offer 10% fire damage protection too, on top of that. The typical fantasy trolls largely share the regeneration trait, which is their special feature. With 50% faster army morale recovery, an army that lost a battle will recover to full morale in only one month. The reinforce speed is also 25% faster, which paired with a 33% faster manpower recovery speed will make the troll armies impossibly resilient on the field. If not stack wiped, they will return again and again in full force until their enemies are attritioned and prepared into delicious meals for the victorious giants. A quote from the Troll Cookbook mentions that the differences between elves and onions are that onions taste and smell better than elves and they don't cry when you peel their skin off. But the two ingredients mixed make a pretty good soup. As a cherry on top, they're also 10% better at sieging, seeing how enemy walls are just a convenient source of stones for the trolls to rip out and throw back at the defending garrison. The downsides are the significantly lower force limit, higher upkeep cost and double recruitment time. Trolls are especially bad at sailing, with only half the standard naval force limit and with a terrible 10% lower ship durability. Only in the 15th century have they discovered that ocean waters are actually not instantly lethal thanks to the bravery and smartness of matriarch Svala the Crusher Hard Rock. An interview at the time revealed that Trollkind thought oceans were deadly because giant ancestors drowned because of bad dragons. Now Trollkind know big water not bad and matriarch smart and good leader. The final aspect of their military highlights their conservative approach to warfare. Towering monsters with giant rocks smash things good. If it's not broken, don't fix it and therefore military technologies are 10% more expensive to adopt. In Trollkind culture, females have an important role to play. Their society is mainly matriarchal and women are commonly sharing responsibilities with men, thus their high chance to be seen working as advisors or generals. Their immense stature gives them limited sneaking capabilities and their honest, naive and almost poetic nature makes their plans obvious to those around them. In mechanical terms, their spy defense is 20% higher but spy network construction is hindered by 20%. Their cave fortresses are also 20% cheaper to maintain. Their relation improvement is slowed by 30% which paired with a minus 5% administrative efficiency modifier makes their conquest terrifying for smaller races. Aggressive expansion will be a real problem in the troll campaigns. On the flip side of their frightening nature, subjects fall in line more easily with a 10% lower liberty desire. Internally they are doing quite well with 2 points of unrest reduction and halved harsh treatment costs making overextension a smaller problem than usual. Their administration shares traits with the elves in the form of 5% higher technology cost and more expensive institution embracement as both races are uncivilized, monstrous and brutish. Finally, the advantage of not talking too much is that when one does finally speak, their words say exactly what needs to be said, resulting in double the power projection points received from insults. I have never talked about populations before and I recognize this now. The primarily troll majorities will grant 20% more manpower in provinces, 20% slower local movement speed for enemies and 10% higher supply limit, the latter which slightly mitigates the native winter conditions. The population bonuses really synergize with other ones to help make their lands a strong fortress with no want for manpower. The Mountain Watcher's religion is unique to Obertroll 
and is in the same faith group as the Ogre Feast of the Gods. Even if humans make good food, the trolls have more of an eat-to-live philosophy rather than the live-to-eat approach of the ogres. Mountain Watchers is strangely one of my favorite religions. In the base bonuses they have my personal favorite one, which is movement speed. Between the religious population and starting tribal government bonuses, trolls will have a 50% speed advantage in home terrain over regular humans, which is huge! 15% fort defense, paired with the Obertroll administration, second idea and settled tribe government, results in more than triple the fort bonuses that the defensive idea set offers. The tooltip also mentions plus one attrition for enemies, but I believe this is a misspelling for I cannot see evidence that this is actually applied as a modifier anywhere. The second layer of this religion is the holy site mechanic. There are five Jotun holy sites, with the first being Murterhol, our starting capital. The others are the Giant's Mans, the island in the center of the Giant's Grave Sea, Balvororen, the capital of the frozen Mo Orc clan, the hold of Krakdumvror, and the province of Pikanvosamoa in the northern Centaur Plains, making this one of the very rare instances in Anbenar where a nation outside the Forbidden Plains region cares about what's happening around the Lake Federation. The Holy Site bonuses are quite strong and they are also equally valuable to the campaign that they make choosing a bonus over another very difficult. Each of them means a lot. Monarch power points will never be enough, you will be tasked to conquer many provinces, build many buildings including several mage towers, you will be forced to develop a lot of lands suboptimally while having to somehow catch up and keep up with technologies just as suboptimally. Most other armies will be larger, so any military bonuses are welcome, but the infantry combat ability may be the least urgent of them all. My first pick was development cost reduction followed by core creation cost and construction cost respectively. The main disadvantage of the Mountain Watchers is the lack of extra missionaries, which makes the racial purging menus become very interesting indeed. Of course, a nation is defined a lot by their national ideas and how they fit into the larger puzzle. The relevant tradition bonus is the 10% extra production efficiency. This will be welcome later during the mission tree, when good trade goods are discovered in various provinces, but the starting fish resources are garbage. Even if the legitimacy bonus from the first idea is nothing short of useless, the next four ideas synergize very well with other aspects of the tribe. More fort defense, unrest reduction and siege ability are all reinforcing troll kind strengths. The idea cost reduction is welcome, just like any other monarch power point saving methods. Closing into the end of the line, the plus one yearly prestige bonus is there more for flavor, but the set is wrapped up with a solid morale and discipline package. The mission tree is very rewarding. Despite the way it looks, a troll campaign will not be that difficult in a traditional sense thanks to the missions. If I could reduce it to one word, it would be self-sufficiency. You will rely mostly on the human slave mines and the wealth that they will unearth. If you'll be lucky or fast enough, you might even be able to create a colonial empire in Elentir in the mid-game and supplement the income with gold from the precursor lands. First mission deals with the Papa Bear, unsurprisingly. Don't forget to get rid of the transport ships, the fleet will be worthless against the rivers and will only drain your coffers needlessly. Completing the first mission will give temporary morale, siege bonuses, a 5 shock general and a slightly higher land force limit. This works very well if you choose to summon a tribal mercenary company from day one, but don't be shy to recruit regular infantry either, just make sure to hire 4 units to be fully prepared. Also give the tribe estate all available privileges. Bjarnarik and their minions will inevitably attack soon. Take the initiative and declare war on them with the monstrous conquest ASAP. Their force limits and technologies are superior, but you have a 65% defense level 3 mountain fort, 98% with a defensive edit. Even with the tech disparities, your infantry will stand toe to toe with the humans, especially while defending in the mountains. A big advantage is that Bjarnarik's two vassals are dangerously close to rebellion. Try to maneuver and weaken Papa Bear's armies while sparing the River Havik and Sidaiti troops. Once their liberty desire exceeds 50%, they will retreat to their own lands and ignore you as long as your armies stay away from them. The war looks intimidating, but it's surprisingly easy. I religiously take only the provinces with permanent claims to save as much administrative power as possible, state everything and lower autonomy without discrimination. Keep the pressure on the river nations and snipe any of them which is isolated diplomatically. Skaldskola and Urviksten also benefit from capital provinces and mountains, so they are the most difficult of the bunch. 
I have chosen to vassalize Urvikstan early, blocking the Frozen Maw clan from taking advantage of my aggression and expanding into the northern Gerudia. Vassalizing a non-monstrous nation of different culture and religion is tricky because getting them to 190 opinion and eventually annexing them will be very very difficult. You may choose to purge the humans, of course, but it's not strictly necessary. Oppressed human minorities are fairly useless and the slave miners will not be integrated anytime soon. They do only offer a slight manpower bonus, which is insignificant, but the administrative power costs to expel or purge them are too great. The mission tree will convert the primary culture and religion in many provinces when some missions are completed. In addition to that, there will be many occasions where religious and cultural conversion bonuses will be offered, so take full advantage of those. Aside from the conquest of the reverse branch, there are a few ones that run in parallel. These focus on economic growth, government reform and colonization. Quickly after annexing Sidait, the northern Bjarnrik vassal, you receive a free colonist and some bonuses as a gift to lead an expedition in search of the forest trolls that hide in the wild Gulmork woods. You will find them after colonizing the first province and may sell human slaves to them in exchange for an additional massive set of colonization bonuses. Selling humans will also replace the primary culture and religion in your northern human provinces. As a colonization policy, native trading policy is the best if you don't want to assign a force to guard the colonies. The policy synergizes with the forest troll bonus and nullifies the native uprising chance, but native repression can work well too. The right branch, which focuses on economic growth, requires a large amount of development, but will replace weak trade goods with better ones and apply many different production bonuses together with additional free development points, and in some cases will also replace the primary culture and religion in several select provinces. This will be very costly in terms of diplomatic power points, but it's essential to advance down the branch in order to be able to afford keeping colonies, advisors and border forts. Keeping advisors is further encouraged by the Shamanic Union mission. Having a female advisor in each slot after contacting the forest trolls will apply a tier 2 government reform which makes the same culture advisors cost slightly cheaper. You will need any bit of extra monarch power, so it's a welcome bonus. Note that the mission will grant the reform for free, saving you 100 government reform progress points that you don't need to spend on the tier 2 reform. The Drail labor mission is vital to improving the capital for the later ones. It negates the arctic malice, but not the mountain terrain one. Due to relentless conquests, it took me more than 20 years to reach administration tech level 3. Try to prioritize the spending of military points on developing it for the subsequent missions. But don't forget that you may save a lot of mana by pillaging enemy capitals too. The old Jotun capital, Giant's Mans, the island in the middle of the drowned giant sea, is also critical for completing the tumultuous tale of the tiny troll tribe. Once the island is secured and the Jotun tower is restored, it and the capital become impregnable fortresses. In the meantime, troll conquistadors map the eastern wastes and clear the road to Hirtsiki, the mythical birthplace of giants. In the west, they bravely splash into the ocean and begin building a fleet and infrastructure required to rule the newly tamed waves and perhaps explore the vast ocean towards the sunset. In Dalr, mammoths are brought back from the wastes and are used initially for their ivory and furs before the giant kin learn how to ride them in combat. Humans from all over Kanor come to trade in the markets of northern Gerudia to the surprise and consternation of the tropes. Being technologically backwards, isolated diplomatically and having a smaller than usual force limit, you will always be a potential target of aggression, even from relatively small nations. Once bordering the Grey Orcs, for example, they will attack without question, even if their armies will be smashed against the trees with ease by the mighty trolls. I've never been attacked more times in an Ambenar campaign as I was in this one, so keep that in mind and fortify all your borders just in case. I chose to open with the Exploration Idea Group, but I was too late to the colonization party. By the time my explorers set sail, Canorian gnomes were already colonizing the lonely island, cutting me off from Dalair for quite some time. Eventually, the tribe evolves, learns to read and use runes, and learns about its history from the reclaimed libraries of the Yotun. The tribe embraces the legacy of the giants of old, proclaims a northern custodian kingdom, and names it after King Gerud. Hail Gerudagot! And of course, the mission tree expands, but Gerudagot receives a fresh new set of ideas too. Many ideas are similar and switched around, and in some cases slightly buffed, while some of the more worthless Obertroll idea bonuses are replaced with better ones. Some notable new highlights include 
10% trade power, an extra general shock pip, 10% reduced fire damage taken and 15% core creation cost reduction. The Northern Custodian Tier 1 government reform is a monarchical government that replaces the previous tribe structure. It allows a small war score cost reduction for provinces taken in wars and cheaper construction costs. Institutions will spread faster and you may enjoy the monarchy reform options. On the negative side, land maintenance and reinforce costs will increase by 30% and some 10% land force limit is lost in the transition. Sadly, 20% movement speed and 25% fort defense is also sacrificed in the name of civilization. The expanded mission tree concerns itself with the building of an empire in Gerudia and to the east of it into the northern pass and beyond. The main goal is to enforce the ordning, the rule of the strong over the weak and ensure the prosperity of Gerudia. There are several different smaller goals along the way, like the reclamation and restoration of the Jotun holy sites or avenging the betrayal of the giants of old by the dwarves. One of the first events is the change of capitals from the mountains to the coast. Reverhaven is renamed to Vesimli and the capital with a part of its development is moved into a proper palace. In enforcing the ordning, the trolls must subjugate the grey orcs and task them to retrieve humans for food and labor and save the moss hides ogres from extinction. They must trample the old dwarven capital of Almdir and smash the walls of Kraktum Vror. Far in the east, they must battle the centaur hordes. They are a formidable enemy, but the centaurs, who are strong in the plains, are easily crushed against the runic wards in the woods and hills of the northern pass. Eventually, Gerudagot's ambitions lead them to subjugate or conquer the ogres in the mountains west of the centaur plains to have them enforce the ordning over the horsemen and humans of the steppes. Throughout the campaign, Gerudagot will enjoy a multitude of permanent province modifiers, with the most common being these runic wards, which make the forts they enchant nearly impregnable. Next to these, there is a plethora of prosperity buffs for the Gerudia region. If the trolls braved the waves and gathered sufficient naval tradition, they may establish the Kranmaser division in memory of the drowned king Kranmas. This gives free marine force limit and an expanded naval force limit, even if not as much to annul their natural malice. Conquering the Moor Hills will mitigate the spy network construction malice somewhat by employing the local dragonfly spies, which is neat. Becoming master of mammoths will bestow tremendous cavalry cost reduction and combat bonuses, but this requires having a 20% cavalry combat ability bonus to begin with, which in my campaign I did not achieve even while I pushed into the late 17th century. Developing the 5 holy sites grants the 5 towers rebuilt bonus for extra ship trade power and some mage estate bonuses. It also enables the trolls to launch an expedition into the northern wastes to investigate a strange signal that is sensed by the mages. Following the signal will bring ruin to many expeditions, but if they are persistent enough they will uncover a forgotten tower and a set of powerful relics that can bestow different great boons on the rulers of Gerudagot. A side note is that the relic bonus is permanent but the relics may be swapped every 10 years or so via decision, so it's fairly flexible which makes it very cool. Conquering all Gerudia, Northern Pass and Il Moitza will culminate in the declaration of an internal empire for extra unrest reduction and production efficiency. The final two major buffs are the Grand Palace of Vesimli and the declaration of the Agirvoda Empire. The Grand Palace grants tax, prestige and legitimacy bonuses and a 5% administrative efficiency one to annul the natural troll administration malice. The final tier 1 government reform is a major improvement over the northern custodian ones on all fronts and adds additional army maintenance cost reduction, absolutism and government capacity. A nice little bonus when becoming an empire is noticing the hidden extinct race of true giants in the accepted culture section of the government tab. There is no way to bring them back as far as I am aware but this is a nice touch. From this point on, the trolls are free to indiscriminately launch assaults on Kanor and the world to conquer all the little humans and their friends. The troll campaign is really satisfying as you start as an extremely poor and backward tribe and advance with great strides into the unsuspecting world around you. It's very interesting to witness their naive journey into civilization. They don't really understand why the little humanoids are upset. The trolls just came back into their own tower homes, which have always belonged to them. In the meantime, they send the screaming little ones to work in the mines or in the kitchens, 
some will stir the pots and some will boil in it. It's simply the order of things, no need to make such a fuss about it. The major downsides are the fact that they will always struggle with technological advances, will lag behind on innovation the whole game and the aggressive expansion that they accrue will basically never disappear. The amount of options and viable decisions to make is astounding though. With so many drawbacks, it is up to the player to choose which drawbacks they would like to mitigate and which to ignore. Will you rush to get exploration and conquer the new world, or simply double down on innovativeness and catch up with the rest of the world? Will you stay monstrous and conquer indiscriminately, or will you demonstrify and employ vassals more efficiently? Sure, all of their tools support direct conquest with lower province war score, lower CCR and less unrest, but their vassals are also more manageable and the trolls have a hegemony on ivory which guarantees extra 2 diplomatic reputation points. Will you actually get espionage ideas and manage aggressive expansion that way, or just fight coalitions for the rest of the late game? Another cool thing is that in no point did I really find the need to get the quantity ideas. As much as force limit is a problem, I found offensive much more viable as an initial military idea set, mitigating their recruitment time and force limit somewhat, while reinforcing their siege ability advantage. Troll units are very strong in the early parts of the game and start lagging behind later in comparison to humans or elves, but at that point it should not matter that much. Overall a very cool tag to play, which received a lot of love in the light and dark expansion. If you haven't given them a try yet, what are you waiting for? I would like to give a special thanks to my patron Beconomics and a general hello to everyone who enjoys my content. Cheers and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye bye.